I'm very pleased to be welcoming you to the first of our Future Social Service Institute Family Violence Alumni Events for 2020. It's been a really rocky start to the year and many of you um, will be working endless hours in responding to the virus. The frontline services are experiencing incredible challenges at the moment. So we've gone online to do this series to bring you some conversations and insights about leadership. I'm really pleased to introduce Jed Carney. Jed's one of nine children born in, in Richmond, was, is a qualified nurse, registered nurse, and has a Bachelor of Education, has worked as both a nurse and a nurse educator. Jed has a really extensive history in a range of leadership roles. She became an official in the Australian Nurses Federation in 1997 and has served as Assistant Federal Secretary, President, Victorian Branch President, and was then elected in 2010 as the ACTU President. Since 2018, Jed has been the elected representative for Batman, now Cooper, and is the Shadow Assistant Minister for Skills and the Shadow Assistant Minister for Aged Care. Thanks for joining us today, Jed. Really pleased to be able to have this conversation with you. Great pleasure and honour. So, Jed, of all of all, out of all of that um, experience, can you talk to us about what feminist leadership means to you, and and a bit of a bit of your thoughts and experience, and and an example from your experience? Well, it's interesting because all my life I have really spent a great deal of time with women. Uh, I am one of uh, six girls. I have three brothers, but I went to an all girls school. Irish Catholic family. Uh, I went nursing, as we say, so I worked in a very feminised workforce um, with a lot of women and a great women leaders, I can say. So when I stepped into the male-dominated world of the ACTU and then into politics, it was quite a shock in many ways. Um, but I think it's given me a really good insight into um, feminist leadership and the difference it can make. And one thing I will say is that you do definitely need women in positions of leadership. There's no doubt about that. If we don't have women in those positions, I firmly believe that issues that are important to women do not rise to the top and um, are not given the priority that they deserve. And a perfect example is the issue of paid parental leave. Australia was one of the last two countries in the OECD to have paid parental leave, and that was driven mostly by a woman I admire greatly, uh, Jenny Macklin, who was elected back in 1996, was only one of three women in the Cabinet at the time. And um, if it weren't for Jenny, just pushing and pushing and pushing the issue of paid parental leave would never have come to the fore. And uh, she tells wonderful stories about the different tactics she used to have to get the men on the Cabinet over the line in the party. And um, so really you do need women in positions of leadership to make those really important things um, a priority. We're seeing some extraordinary women leaders across the world in responding to the COVID-19 crisis at the moment. What do you think we are learning from this crisis? And as a parliamentarian, what do you think are the things that our leaders really need to be considering in designing the recovery? From this this time? I think what we're learning is that there is such a thing as society, that uh, in times of crisis you really need to come together as community and help each other and this whole theory that we are only individuals and that we exist alone is just really being pushed to the side and that there is a role for governments, there is a role for social services and uh, if we didn't have those, look how lucky we are in Australia that we do have a decent health system, that we do have a great public education system, that we've got wonderful workers like, like you out there helping us through this crisis. So I hope that we really get an understanding of the need of community and society and that post-crisis, like I think there's a real danger, Michaela, that we are going to see this government respond to the massive um, debt, I guess, we are um, seeing accrue now with an austerity uh, agenda, which would be a disaster because, as we know, in austerity agendas, um, basically what they do is they cut services, community services that are predominantly feminised, 
as we know, like the one that I worked in, like the one that you work in, um, public services, are uh, certainly where we see the axe come down and the so-called fat trimmed. That's the last thing I would want. So I'm really hoping that this understanding that we need community, that we need services, is going to drive the post-crisis um, recovery. We're going to have to be loud about this and we're really going to have to fight against this because I'm not quite sure the government is there. But I think this is going to be an incredibly important part of the, the recovery and hopefully the Labor Party will step up to that. So what is your message to the frontline workers, Jed? My message is you are incredibly important. You are really rising to the top now as one of the most crucial parts of our society and uh, that we really need you to stay strong, we really need you to stay committed and we really need you to keep doing the work that you're doing. And remember that, you know, even though we are predominantly a feminised workforce, that we have a lot to contribute and that we are valued. Um, I remember... Uh, I was asked to remember a story when a, a leadership in a crisis story, I couldn't really find one, but I do remember that when I was a young nurse and I was a union delegate, I was working um, at the Austin Hospital actually at the time, and we were taking industrial action. It was way back in 1996 and it was kind of a new thing. We closed beds and we weren't letting any fee-paying patients come in. We were only admitting um, our public patients. And the, one of the surgeons got a bit upset about this and I got called up to a ward I remember getting out of the lift and I could hear him shouting at the nurses at the top of his voice and I thought, oh, crikey, this is awful. I got down to the ward and they pushed me forward to talk to him and he's looked at me and he said, you're the one, you're the one causing all this trouble. I'm going to have you sacked. You'll never nurse in this country again. Um, I looked at him and all these things were going around in the back of my head like protected industrial action, like, you know, he couldn't sack me, that this was all legal. But all I could squeak out, I was so terrified, was, I don't think so. And he's like, what? What? Of course I can have you sacked. And I'll have all those nurses behind you sacked. And I'm like, I don't think so. I just was too nervous. I, for some reason, I couldn't get anything else out. And in frustration, he walked away. And I remembered when he'd gone, I was so relieved. And I sort of, my shoulders dropped. And then I remembered all the nurses were behind me. And when I turned around and looked at them, they all went, I don't think so. <laughs> I never lived it down. But it reminded me two things, and this is really what I want you to know from this story, is that, number one, I realised I didn't have to be, a, you know, a great speech giver. I didn't have to be brilliant. I didn't have to be a bloke, big, burly or loud. I just had to know I was right and I had to stand my ground. And those two things have stood me in really good stead forever. And so know you are right. You are doing good work. And we will stand our ground and we will make sure we come out of this stronger. And boy, you were right. And boy, was he wrong. <laughs> he was wrong. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jed. Thank you for your time. My pleasure. Thanks, Michaela. Thanks, everybody.